Hello, testing, testing. Vince, tell me when we're on. Are we on? Okay, we're live. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. We're here at Breakwater Church, and we're open for business. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to open with Psalms, Psalms 81. It says, sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to God of Jacob. Rise a song and strike the timbrel. Hallelujah. The pleasant harp with lute. Blow the trumpet at the time, the new moon, and full moon on our solemn feast. For this is the statute for Israel, a law of God, of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went through the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. So sing aloud, O Israel. Hallelujah. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. is for us who could ever stop us and if our god is with us what could stand against and if our god is for us who could ever stop us and if our god is with us and what could stand
Who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now sing along in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I Bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I can't want this. Same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name.
Let me be singing when the evening comes. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your. great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find yeah so bless the lord oh my soul oh oh my soul worship his home Strength is failing and draws near, and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Evermore. So bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Yes, I worship Your holy name. Lord, I worship Your holy name. Everybody's going to help me on this one. Uh, please sing along because uh, I need some help. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betray. Sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned bowing to the father's will he took a crown of thorns Now the curse of sin 
has no hold on me whom the sun sets free Ross Russell here. All right. What a treat. Thank you. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Sounds good. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
Dear Lord, Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us once again. Thank you for this sanctuary, Lord, where we can gather as a church and worship you, Lord, acknowledge you as our Lord and Savior, Lord. Thank you for being in our lives, Lord, for breaking the chains and saving us, saving us, Lord. I mean, life goes by so fast. The next thing you know, all you do need is Christ. And thank you so much that we found out before we died, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. We love this church. We're missing our pastor right now, but we got a great man coming up here today. Thanks, Ross Russell, for being here, Lord. And we, we, we really miss Kurt. He's just, we just hope he's got, he's blessed and he catches the biggest fish in the lake. Yeah. Lord, uh, I, I pray these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now we have a, about three or four minutes where we gather and we greet one another. And uh, so I would like to fill that spot <laughs> while they greet one another. Hallelujah. We just thank you, Lord, and praise you. Here you go, Ross. Like to read a scripture while we greet one another. So in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in this creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. Woo, that's a blessing, isn't it? Well, we thank you, Father, for being able to be here and gather together since we have been shut down for a while and we have been limited to capacity. So, Father, I thank you right now that we are open and running. In Jesus' name, we thank you. We're doing quite a work in Malawi, and our finances have covered everything of all their needs. So we thank you for it, and uh, we're going to do tithes and offerings. And your blessing to Africa Outreach will be needed, hallelujah, and blessed. I would like to read the scripture. It says, now he who supplies seed in the sower and bread for food, now he who supplies, we know it's God the source, and the seed is finances, will also supply and increase your more store of seeds and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Generous on every occasion. <laughs> and through, through as your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So your giving will be result in people thanksgiving to God. Hallelujah. We just glorify your name right now, Lord. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. i 
anointed one, Jesus. 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 Risen and exalted one, Jesus. Your name is like a Your spirit's like water to my soul. Your word is the lamp to my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Thank you, praise and worship team. That was great. Hallelujah. Jesus is the only one. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you and praise you for the giver this morning. We thank you, Father God, that you will bless them with all the promises in Malachi, that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that they cannot contain, pressed down, shaken together, and running over into their laps. Rebuke the devourer at their doorstep, Father God. We thank you for it. We thank you that these funds will be used to, for the nations, Father God, and for our church to stay open, Father God. And we just thank you right now that our neighborhood will be blessed. And, Father, we just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Father, we just have a great speaker here with us today. Father, he is a friend of Breakwater's. And pretty regular here. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Ross Russell, come on. Come on ahead, Ross. Bless you. How are you? Good to see you. All right. Oh, you I have this, so yeah, I'm good. Okay. It's so good to be here. It's like a home away from home. Yes. As we learn about the journey to Rome. Hey, I'm a poet and I didn't know it. So how are you all doing today? It is a beautiful day. It is amazing. So, did everybody get the notes? Yeah. Notes in the map? Okay, great. So, today we're looking at the 27th chapter of Acts. I'm actually in the third part um, at our church. And so, to bring you up to speed, looking at this map here that I've given you all, Paul is been told by Jesus when he was in the barracks at Caesarea, he was told he was going to go to Rome. And so he, had, he, had brought, he was brought before King Agrippa and his sister Bernice and the governor Festus under the accusation of defiling the temple by bringing a Gentile in and by disregarding the law of Moses, which he did not do. He had upheld the law of Moses because Jesus fulfills it, right? And... Um, he did not take uh, Gamaliel, his friend, into the temple. But nonetheless, he was stood trial before these guys, and he was found to be innocent, but because he appealed to Caesar, he's going to Rome. And it's all God's plan because God wanted him to go to Rome to testify. So now he's a prisoner on the ship. As you look at this map, they've left um, Caesarea, went up the coast, and because of these really strong outer water winds, if any of you guys know what, it like, what it's like to be out in the channel between here and the Channel Islands, 
off of Santa Barbara when you're in a boat out there. It's really windy offshore, but not so windy close to shore. So you can follow this track around north, north of Cyprus there along Pamphylia. They stayed close to shore out of the wind, and it took about 10 to 15 days to go from Sidon to Mara, and then another 10 to 15 days just to go to Nidus because they were going right against the wind there, super hard, strong winds. So then they went south, if you look at your map there, to Salmon. They went straight. That way the wind was blowing to their side, and they were able to sail south. They went under the Lee of Crete on your map there. And once again, it's like going behind the Channel Islands or Catalina. You're getting out of the wind, and it's easier to sail. They stayed at Fair Havens, and Paul at that point said, you know, you guys, I think we should just stay here for the winter. And the captain of the ship and Julius the Centurion had a talk. And the captain felt confident that he could sail on, but it was actually at the end of sailing season. And the Romans, after the fast, after the Feast of Booths, determined that to be pretty much suicidal to start sailing west into the ocean at this point. So against Paul's godly counsel, they went ahead and, and sailed out into the ocean, and they've had a terrible time, okay? And the wind is really hard, and they're trying to go west, but in order to go west, they're having to sail. If you're trying to go this way, you sail northwest so that this strong north wind that's hitting them, like a Santa Ana wind, a really strong north wind, they, they're sailing that way, so as the wind blows, it gives them a general west course, if you can picture that. If they sail west, they'll end up down there. So they're sailing that way, and it's kind of pushing them in the way they want to go. But it's gotten really heavy. They've had to jettison the cargo they were bringing, their livelihood. They've had to throw tackle overboard, the spars, you know, on the, on the big sail. They've had to show, throw a bunch of stuff overboard um, just to survive, okay? And uh, so it's like, you know, they have Gilligan, and he's trying to help, but he's not much help at all. They, and the skipper's trying to get wisdom from the professor, but the professor doesn't much, know much more than he is. And Paul's in the middle of all these guys as the only godly counsel. And he's like, I, you should have listened to me. <laughs> you know? And so that's where we pick up um, in our story. We're out there in the middle of the Mediterranean. And uh, an angel of the Lord has just appeared to Paul and said, get, I've got good news for you. You're going to survive. So turn to Acts 27, verse 21. And uh, before I start, uh, I just want to explain to you the things that we've got from that whole first part of the trip, the main points, just to get you guys up to speed, is number one, all of God's promises are yes. If God says it, believe it. He's promised that Paul's going to get to Rome, believe it. He's promised that we're going to go to heaven if we're in Christ, believe it and all the other promises. Number two, don't be afraid. Okay, they're out there in the middle of the storm, and they're being, the angel is exhorting him not to be afraid. Okay, trust in the Lord in situations you have no control over. Okay, trust in situations you have no control over. Paul had, has no control over the situation. The centurion, Julius, and the captain of this Alexandrian ship have made this decision. And he has no control over it. He has to trust the Lord. And uh, when your plans have been changed, trust God to lead you on that next thing. And then simply do that thing that he's shown you to do. Just simple obedience. So let's read starting in verse 21. But before I start, I'd like to pray. Dear Lord, I, I thank you, dear God, for your word. I thank you that you've given us instruction uh, to live. I thank you, Lord, that your word is true. I pray you'll open our minds to understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So starting with verse 21, it reads, When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. They are so moated right at this point. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me saying, do not be afraid, Paul. 
You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. I love that. They put that word exactly in there for a reason. Paul said, I believe what God told me. It's going to happen exactly as he told me. And you know, we need to believe that God is going to do things exactly as he has told us. Verse 26, but new plan, we must run aground on a certain island. So I know I'm going to Rome. I don't know how it's going to work out, you know, as I'm on this crazy ship with all you guys, but I know it's going to work out. So at this point, they're choosing to follow Paul's godly counsel now because he's the only one that really knows what's happening. The angel has just given him the memo, right, an update. And they're sailing on looking for an island that God wants them to land on. Now, speaking of people landing on islands, I read about a man that was found on a deserted island. The sailors that found him were surprised to see three large buildings on the island. You may have heard this before, but they asked the man why he had built, built these buildings. Well, the first building is my house. And I was able to set up a crude aqueduct to create some form of indoor plumbing. And the sailors were really impressed and asked about the second building. Oh, the second building is my church, he said. I'm a Christian, and my faith is really important to me. And they said, okay, well, what about the third building? Oh, that's the church that I used to go to. (laughs) So, anyway, pretty funny. Um, So now, starting in verse 27, but when the 14th night came, can you count 14, 14 nights in a storm? When the 14th night came... As we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, I forgot I have my verses here. Oh, there it is. Boom. Okay. When the 14th night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. Okay, it's been 14 nights since they left Fair Havens. It's called Fair Havens for a reason, right? (laughs) That would have been safer there. That's a lot of stormy weather. Can you imagine 14 nights? They are in the Adriatic Sea, if you look on your map, which lies between Italy, Malta, Crete, and Greece. In ancient times, it's believed that the Adriatic Sea covered all the way down to Africa, and they called it the Adrian Sea at that point. Now, it says that they began to surmise that they were nearing land, and this would have been done by hearing the sound of the waves, because it's in the dark, right? And... uh, They want to make sure they don't hit the reef or sandbar or whatever they're going to run into in the dark. They just want to get close enough. uh, There's a guy that goes to our church on the beach who sailed the South Pacific, and he said that, you know, even the daytime when you're coming on a reef like in Bora Bora or Tonga, you're looking for surf because wherever there's surf, there's reef or sandbar. You want to look for a, a gap, you know, in the island to get through. And so that means they're getting close to the island. It says here it was midnight. And if anybody's ever sailed at night, it's kind of scary out there. It's so dark. Anybody sailed at night? It's just a little spooky out there when it's all black without any kind of guidance. This darkness would have made it really difficult. And uh, so let's go on to verse 28. It reads, They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little farther on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. So they measured the depth of the sea by letting down a weighted line. They didn't have sonar back then. So it was getting shallower. And it was time to put on the brakes and wait for daylight. Okay? So verse 29 reads, Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. My friend uh, Dave Albinus, Albinus, he also told me of a time where he was, he went around most of the world in a sailboat, but he went out with some friends during the day on a little trip, and then when they came back, they couldn't find the pass in the reef, and it was getting dark, and so they literally had to park outside and stay all night, and in the morning when daybreak came, then they were able to go find the hole to get through. He said Bora Bora is very difficult, specifically, and uh So it says here, they cast out four anchors. So this is a big ship. And we also will know in verse 38 later on that there's 276 men on it. 
So this is not like the SS Minnow. It's not like a little Catalina 30. This is a big ship, okay? More like a, these ones you see down in San Pedro, right? But with sails. While they were setting, now while they were setting anchor, some of these men tried to get away. Verse 29. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow. Okay, so they had this little boat that they'd been pulling along behind them in case their big boat broke. And then in the storm, they had pulled it on board because it was starting to fill up with water and creating drag. So they had this little boat on top like a dinghy. So... Some of the crewmen took this dinghy out and were getting in it to um, pretend like they were setting anchor, but they really wanted to bail, pun intended, right? They really wanted to leave. And um, so Paul was wise to it. It says in verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Okay, that's an important verse right there. Because I've heard this uh, told in many ways, you know, about losing your salvation or keeping your salvation, you know, got to stay on the ship. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean to stay on the ship? So I've done some studying this week and pondering and meditating and all that. And I've reached my temporary conclusion since I'm learning like everybody else, right? I'm just forced to learn a little bit more because I have to teach, right? But it's really fun, really, to learn all these things. But here's the deal. What it's saying here is remain in the ship. In other words, abide in the ship. Abide in Christ. So the ship represents Christ, the body of Christ. We're in Christ, right? So the first note in your notes that we're going to look at right now is all the way down to number six, because I covered the last five on a previous message, but all five of those notes are really important because Paul has been having to do all those things leading up to this moment, okay? Trusting the Lord for these new plans. So abiding in Christ, what does this mean, okay? Um, It means not apathetically waiting for salvation. Once saved, always saved. I can go out to the bars, do whatever I want. I mean, his mercy covers my sin. I can do whatever. You know, you throw a caution to the wind. I'm part of the elect. Hey, let's have fun. I mean, you know, don't be such a party pooper, right? But you heard Kurt say this so many times. We are in a synergistic relationship with God. We act, he responds. We act, he responds. We act, he responds. Because he wants us to have lives that bear fruit, We have a purpose. We're not just to take grace as a license to sin. It's not just getting on the boat. It's staying on the boat. Okay? It's staying on the boat, remaining in Christ, following Jesus. I was watching The Chosen last night, episode five. Have you seen that? It's powerful, huh? When... When Peter gets his catch of fish and Jesus looks at him and says, follow me, he gets it. He gets it. But Lord, I'm a sinful man. No, no, I know that. (laughs) Follow me. Abide in me. Come with me. Live with me. Watch me. Do what I do. Say what I say. And one day you will do it without me. Abide in me. Just because we know we're saved doesn't mean we don't need to act on that salvation. Live as the king's kids that we are. Be holy as we are holy. Our love for God is shown by our actions. Faith without works is dead. Paul knew he was going to Rome, but he didn't know how it was all going to work out. You see that? He had to continue to do what God had shown him to do in the present in order to reach the goal in the future. Does this mean we can lose our salvation? No. This means that we act like someone who's saved. Does that make sense? Those who endure, and I'll get to this in a minute, are the ones that are saved. The ones that fall away were never his anyway. 
This is deep stuff. Can you see why I was pondering it over my oatmeal? We are saved outside of time. In the meantime, it says that we're seated in the heavenly realms with Christ in Ephesians 2, 6. We are already there. Look at your neighbor and say, that's trippy. No, we are already there outside of time. And our baptism is symbolizing of us being baptized into Christ, death and resurrection with him. Okay, now let's start being that person. It's heavy stuff. This is really cool. It's really great. We are saved out of, outside of time. In the meantime, we have to walk in obedience to see how God is going to get us there. See that? We've got to keep being Christians to see how God's going to work all that out. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. We can't ignore what God has asked us to do. Stay on the ship. Man the helm. Put up the sail. Put up the jib. Man the ship. Don't just sit there in the galley. Watching Netflix, or so some of them are good. I actually got pure flicks because I ran out of good Netflix. Some of them are so dark. It's like I needed some light. Pure flicks. Anyway, so we can't ignore what God has asked us to do. We can't ignore the way God has called us to live. Francis Schaeffer said that. Schaeffer said, How then we should how then should we live? Well, here's the instruction manual. That's how. I'm sorry, but CNN doesn't have the answer. Oprah doesn't have the answer. Or certainly our woke people don't have the answer. They have to wake up so that they won't be woke down. So we can't ignore the way God has called us to live. It is a means to a wonderful end. God had me write that. What we're doing now is a means to a wonderful end. According to Barnes, one of those old guys, commentators, we have this case of, in this case, a full answer to the objection that a belief in the decrees of God will make people neglect the means of salvation and lead to licentiousness. In other words, people are going to take grace as a license to sin if you tell them that. Well, here is a case in which Paul certainly believed in the purpose of God to save these people in which he was assured that it was fully determined. And yet, see, because he knew he's going to Rome, he could just kick back and play back backgammon, right? But no. In which case, he was sure it was fully determined, and yet the effect was not to produce indolence and unconcern, but to prompt him to use strenuous efforts to accomplish the very effect which God had determined should take place. Whoa. Think about that for a second. Us living in Christ every day, taking it, running after Christ to accomplish the goal that he's already determined for us anyway. Isn't that cool? That leads me to the point number seven in your notes. So, I keep forgetting to do this right here. Twenty-four, thirteen. before it says, those who endure to the end will be saved. Wait, what does that mean? You mean I have to keep enduring every day, you know, in order to be saved? I mean, does that mean I can lose my salvation? What happens if I have a really bad week? Can I lose my salvation? What does that mean? Those who endure to the end will be saved. What it means is those who endure to the end are the saved ones. And it'll also if you stay in Christ and abide in him, he'll protect you physically and help you continue to run the race and finish the task that he's given you. Man the ship. Stay on the boat. Keep the sails up. Keep the boat light. You're running aground. Do what you got to do. Maintain the ship in your life, your boat, in order to accomplish the goal that God has for you. How do we do this? We start by repenting. That's the first thing we all did when we came to Christ. Repent, believe. Repenting is changing your mind, right? 
If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Changing your mind about the way you live. That's huge. We looked at that already. So, the one who endures the end, he will be saved. Now, look at this one, 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. If you're in Christ, you're an overcomer. You will overcome. (coughs) Paul is going to overcome the storm. They are going to make it because he's going to Rome. We're going to heaven. You see that? But keep your hand to the task because we don't know how God's going to get us there. Does that make sense? On earth. We know outside of time we're saved. Repent, believe, be holy, follow Jesus, abide in him, and trust the process. He will lead us to salvation. He will lead us to salvation. Revelation 3.21 says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I found a great quote at clarityministries.org. Though endurance is not a condition for being saved or remaining saved for the child of God, endurance is an absolute necessity for a lifetime of fruitfulness and blessing from God. Let me say that again. Though endurance is not a condition for being saved or remaining saved for the child of God, endurance is an absolute necessity for a lifetime of fruitfulness and blessing from God. You see that? It's not going to get us more saved than we're already saved. That's legalism. It's something that we have to do to bear fruit. Because that's why we're here, to know God and to make Him known. That's our purpose. This morning, two dolphins went in front of me on this wave as I was paddling out. and There were two of them trimmed up like this just right behind the lip and just pocket all the way across. Their purpose was to bless my eyes <laughs> and give glory to God who made those dolphins. They fulfilled their purpose. I was stoked. It was beautiful. We have purpose. Barnes again says, in regard to the decrees respecting salvation, the end is not determined without the means. And as God has resolved that his people shall be saved, so he has also determined the means. In other words, ask him, what do I do next, Lord? I'm here. Thank you for saving me. What do I do next? It's all in, following him like Peter after he gets to catch a fish. He has ordained that they should repent, believe, be holy, and be saved. When Jesus says the one who endures to the end will be saved, he is talking about those who are born again, having transformed lives, empowered by the Holy Spirit. If you are truly a follower of Jesus, you will shy away from wickedness. You know, we have those moments where we start to get tempted, and we get in there, ah, oh, and then you get out of there. Whoa, that was close, right? Because you hate it. The Holy Spirit hates it. God and you hates it. We're made to be holy. We can't live in wickedness. If you see someone that says they're a Christian and they're living in wickedness, it'll either not be long and they'll repent or they never were his anyway. That's just the way it is. In the ebbs and flows of my life as a Christian over 35 years, I've had those moments where, oh, whoops, uh (laughs) uh-oh. Then I repented and I got back on track. Because I was his. I'm God. I belong to Christ. Christ in me, my hope and glory. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. So I kept on track. So my life has been like real estate. It has its dips, but it's trending up. (laughs) From glory to glory, becoming more like Christ. So we have to pray for those around us that have just come to church a little bit and tasted the heavenly fruits and are falling away because that little seed needs water and they need to understand to be abiding in Christ and finding him in life completely, surrender all in, following Christ. That's what Peter did. And then your salvation is certain in your own heart. You're not wondering if you're saved. The Holy Spirit testifies to my spirit. 
that I'm born again. That's why I can cry, Abba, Father. So I continue in him. I endure like the, what's the motorcycle, the enduro. I got a big enduro for Jesus. And he's going to take me to the power of the Holy Spirit through my life. Catch some air along the way. Do some power slides. <laughs> if you are truly a follower of Jesus, you will shy away from wickedness. You'll call out false teaching. You'll see the prosperity doctrine when you hear it. You'll see these doctrines that, that take grace as a license to sin when you hear it. You'll see uh, the, the doctrines that say that you have to be saved by baptism, all these other legalistic doctrines that are around us. You'll be able to see it. A true follower of Christ will be able to sense it and understand it and will follow God's word. You know, Mark Twain said, it's not the stuff in the Bible that I know that bothers me. It's the stuff in the Bible that I don't. No, it's not the stuff that I don't know in the Bible that bothers me. It's the stuff that I do know in the Bible that bothers me. Mark Twain knew the answers, but Samuel Clemens didn't repent. I don't know that he did. I hope so. Look for him in heaven. He's a pretty funny guy. But uh, we will adhere to God's word. We'll overcome this world and we'll be granted reward in the world to come as we saw that verse right here. That's what we'll have. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest and take your reward. He has an incentive program, by the way. Salesmen weren't the first one to use that. God was. We all need a little incentive, don't we? God worked it out too. If you're born again, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit who is at work in you to give you power to stand strong in your faith and endure. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is good news, you guys. <laughs> Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge, signed, sealed, delivered. Is that good news? Don't worry about losing your salvation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. He will keep you. You, you move, he responds. You act, he responds. He's going to keep you in him. He says, I will not lose one that, I, that have been given to me, which is a whole other teaching on the chosen. I've never met somebody that wishes they were chosen that wasn't, so don't worry about it. Have you? Because if they want to be chosen, they are. That takes care of that. And I believe that we're chosen to choose him. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Calvinian. So... I believe that God chose me, I'm part of the elect, and I have the ability to reject him or receive him. And I am thankful that I received him. Matthew Henry, another one of these old guys, says, God who appointed the end that they shall be saved, appointed the means that they should be saved by the help of these people on the ship, these shipmen, right? So Paul was going to get to Rome, but everybody had to keep manning the ship to get there. We're going to get to heaven, but the church needs to still be the church. We can't all just go to the movie theater, even if it's a really good one like God's Not Dead. We still need to. We have to still be manning the ship. We have to keep about God's business, whatever God's called you to do. We have work to do. Duty is ours. Events are God's. Isn't that good? Duty is ours. Events are God's. Let him take care of all that. We do not trust God, but tempt him when we say we put ourselves under his protection if we do not use proper means such as are within our power or our safety. If those guys just sat down on the, on the ship and started playing, you know, dominoes and all that and just saying, you know, God's going to take care of us. Did you hear Paul's going to Rome anyway? No, it wouldn't have worked out that way. It would have been another way. They would have been at sea bobbing around, hanging on to a, <laughs> a cork or something. You know, they were going to get to Rome eventually, but they didn't know how. So keep doing what God's told you so he can make that all happen. 
Does that make sense? Or else he'll do it another way. But how selfish are men in general often when ready to seek their own safety by the destruction of others? Happy are those who have such a one as Paul in their company. You know what? We all need a Paul in our company, right? That will stand up and encourage us and let us know we're going to be okay. And guess what? You guys may be a Paul right now among ungodly company at work, wherever you go. And you're the one who has the truth. And he wants you to stand up and tell them God's promises. How blessed were they to have him in their company who not only had intercourse with heaven but was an enlivening spirit to those about him. The sorrow of the world works death while joy in God is life and peace and the greatest distress is in danger. To see Paul trusting the Lord in the middle of the storm after 14 days must have blown their minds. How do you feel like that? What is wrong with you? but they wanted it. The comfort of God's promises can only be ours by believing dependence on him. Do you get that? We can only claim the promises if we're in him. Not on the outside. Ooh, let that one sink in. You can't just claim God's promises if you're not his his child. You got to repent first and be in Christ because it's because we're in Christ, Christ in me, that's why it all happens. The comfort of God's promises can only be ours by believing dependence on him to fulfill his word to us, and the salvation he reveals must be waited for in the use of the means he appoints. Let him work all that out. It's going to happen. We just don't know how. We don't know how this COVID thing is going to work out, but it's going to be okay. We don't know how all these small businesses are going to survive, but if they love the Lord and they're abiding in Christ, there's going to be another way. Pray for them. God's going to make a way, though, whether it's through a PPP loan or whatever. There's going to be another way because they're in Christ. If God has chosen us to salvation, he has also appointed that we shall obtain it by repentance, faith, prayer, and persevering obedience. That's the key here. Persevering, excuse me, say it, don't spray it. I teach middle school, so I have to say that persevering, I used to teach middle school, they're somewhere out there in Zoom land, but (laughs) persevering obedience, right? It is a fatal presumption to expect it any other way. It is an encouragement to people to commit themselves to Christ as their Savior when those who invite them clearly show that they do so themselves. So if we want to go out and witness and let people know Jesus loves them, then we need to be about his business and show them that it's real, I mean, don't do it just to show them. You know what I'm saying. But if we're being about God's business, abiding in him on the ship, raising the sails, whoa, ho, ho, off the, you know, of those pirate songs, you know, just trusting the Lord on the high seas. It's all going to work out. Come on, mate. Cheer up, you know. Take a seasick pill and join me, right? We are saved if we put our trust in Christ. John 1.12 says if we believe and receive, then we become children of God. John 3.3 says if you are born again, you'll see the kingdom of heaven. John 3.16 says if you, God sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation through faith, right? Romans 10.9 says if you confess that Jesus is Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart, he rose from the dead, then you will be saved. So if you've done that, you are saved. Past tense. Now act like it. Endure. Abide. Endure. You see this? You know, some people say, oh, all that stuff about obey, obey, obey. Yes, obey. There's a reason. It's not just to obey. It's a means to an end. We are safe with him. Remember what we wrote, read up here. Am I behind on my slides? Let's see here. I'm not used to having this. Sorry, guys. Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. So think about that one for a second. So stay on the ship. Tend to your business. What is your role? Got back here doing video, doing media, 
got people cleaning this place like John, got people teaching, preaching, people doing the prayer ministry, got women's groups getting together, men's groups, got trips to Malawi. We got people working on the roof, people, people giving money to help support it all. We all have different roles, right? Keep doing it in order for the boat to keep going to get to heaven. Our boat that we're all on together, the SS, I don't know, Jesus or whatever, instead of the minnow. So, what was that? <laughs> so, put your hand to what you're supposed to do. Put your hand to the plow. Bear fruit for the kingdom. That's what obeying Christ is all about. ClarityMinistries.org once again says, I like this, our salvation from beginning to end is in Christ. From beginning to end. Looking to him, we who are his may also finish well. Enduring the trials of life guarantees that we will. If you're enduring the trials of life and staying in Christ, that means you are his. Keep doing it. Isn't this good stuff? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And we all know those things in our own lives. Actually, it happened literally to me because today I took off in front of somebody. I didn't see him, and we got tangled up with our leashes. <laughs> the sins that so easily entangles us. <laughs> and I had to separate and say I'm sorry and repent. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, what did he do? Endured. There it is. He endured for us. Let's endure for him. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It is finished, right? He's there. Abide in Christ. Throw off the excess cargo of your ship. Do you have extra stuff on your boat you need to get rid of? Get rid of it. What's the junk that's, that's, that's encumbering you, right? Throw off the tackle. Do you need that spar, all those things on a boat, the booms and all that? Throw it over. Get rid of it. If it's holding you back from abiding in Christ and following him, get rid of it. That's what he's saying. Maintain your boat. Maintain it so many will be saved from the tempest of their, their lives all around us. People are in storms all around us. Being tossed. In the meantime, remain on the ship. So what do you think? My temporary conclusion. Is it making sense? It's deep, huh? I've always stumbled on that verse in Matthew 24. Those who endure to the end will be saved. What does that mean? Well, I believe that we're saved. Now act like it, and you will endure because Christ in you will help you endure. But you got to do it. As, as Kurt always says, we participate in the kingdom of God. As we move, he moves. So now to verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. So, so much for that plot to escape. The boat's gone, right? That takes care of that. Then Paul took time to minister to the crew and encourage them in the middle of the night. So now he's got a place to speak. They were following Julius, the centurion, and the captain. They've all been totally moated, right, because <laughs> their plan didn't work. So now they're listening to Paul. So look at what happens in verses 33 to 36. Until the day was about to dawn, still dark, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. Not, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. So these guys are spent. They're done. They're like you pictures of firemen, you know, in fire season, you see them, they're just all blackened and wasted from fighting fires for two or three days without eating and 
sleeping and all that, you know, protein bars or something. These guys have been on edge, full of adrenaline, barely sleeping for 14 days. That's a long run. There's been no food. Hey, when's breakfast? Sorry, man. Well, how about lunch? Sorry, man. <laughs> hey, when's dinner? Oh, no, not yet. So these guys are starving. Can you say in and out Burger at that point, right? So now they're at the point of exhaustion. And maybe one of you guys is there right now in your life, or you know somebody where they're spent. They're just done emotionally, spiritually. I've been there where you're just down. At one point in my life, I was just in a fetal position on my friend's kitchen floor, just broken. My friend Jim Rusey. I couldn't have been with a better person when it happened. He just loved... (sighs) He just showed tough love, and I needed the tough love and care. Maybe that's you right now. Don't give up. Don't give up. Just keep doing what you need to do to abide in Christ. Read his word. Pray. Stay around Christians. Do things that will, that will fill you with his Holy Spirit. We only get enough from the Holy Spirit gas station for one day. By the end of the day, we're on fumes. We know how that is. Just need to get to bed. Start over tomorrow, right? Just do what God has asked you to do, and He will eventually bring you through. First Peter 5, he's, he, after you suffer for a little while, He will confirm and establish and complete you. It's a beautiful thing. I love First Peter 5. After you've suffered a little while. So if this is you and you're in a storm right now, trust the Lord. Paul reminded them to first eat. Sometimes we forget to eat and take care of ourselves. We get so messed up emotionally and spiritually that we forget to take care of ourselves. You know, Jesus grew in stature, wisdom, and favor with God and favor with man, Luke 2.52. He grew in stature. He took care of himself physically. He, uh, stature, what was the second one? Huh? Wisdom. So he took care of his thinking, thinking straight, reading the, you know, knowing what the word of God that he had in him said, right? He goes, his physical stature, wisdom, favor with God. He made sure his vertical was taken care of, repenting, being, and then also the horizontal, his social life, right? Favor with God, favor with man. If you take care of those four areas in your life, it will help. And these guys needed to eat. So he said, first of all, you guys, you need to eat so that you can at least be alive when we get safely onto this, run, when we run aground so that you're not dead because you're all supposed to live. So first, he said, eat. I always keep a cliff bar in my backpack. You never know when you're going to be low on blood sugar. you got to eat something. That's a slightly different situation than these guys. That's like a... <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. But Paul, and then Paul reminded them what God had promised. We have to be reminded. That's part of my job, Kurt's job. People need to stand up in our lives and tell us, hey, God will do what he said exactly. No, he's going to do it exactly like he said. Not sort of, oh, but you don't know the Bible, you know, some of the verses are different and you can't really, no, no, no. He said it, it's going to happen. And he got up and said, the angel said, not one of your hairs will be lost. And for some of you, that's more than others, right? Everybody's going to survive. He said it, believe it, Right? Especially in a serious trial like this, this was important for them. We need it every day, don't we? We need it every day. Got to take your vitamin J every day. Then after that, what did he do? He gave thanks before they got delivered. I love that. That's faith. He's giving thanks in the storm before they've even run aground, before they've, anything good has happened. But he took the food And he broke it, and he gave thanks to the Lord for the food. Started right there. Thank you, Lord, that we still have some. They saved some grain. They didn't throw everything overboard. We can thank God for just simply just having breath. It's a good start. Not everybody can breathe very well right now with COVID going around, just having good breath. Be thankful for that when you wake up. I've had periods of anxiety where I couldn't get my breath. Praise God for good breath. Thank God that I didn't have to plug in my heart last night next to my iPhone. It just beats anyway. That's pretty cool. Don't think too hard about that. It'll give you high blood pressure. 
But start there. You know, there's always something to give thanks for. And so he demonstrated this thankfulness in the middle of the storm, even in dire straits, even though they weren't in straits. They are in the middle of the ocean. But you know what I'm talking about. So that leads me to the next point in your notes. Be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. There's always a reason to be thankful. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 12, 28 to 29, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Just being thankful is a, is a form of worship before the Lord. Just being thankful, having a thankful heart, honoring God, revering Him. They were all encouraged, had something to eat, and they were ready for the next step. Look at verse 37. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. So they had all had enough to eat, and they threw the rest of the food overboard. Okay, what's that a sign of? Faith. You know, I remember when I was in Chambri Lakes in Papua New Guinea years ago on a mission. We'd been in canoes for three weeks, going around from village to village, just barely surviving in the heat with malaria and crocodiles in the area and spiders and everything else. It was just like a daily preservation. <laughs> and so I saved these, like, this protein bar, like one or two. And when the airplane came to rescue us, on the plane, the airstrip in the middle of the swamps, I ate my protein bar because I trusted that I was going to make it for the rest of the way, right? So at this point, they've had their lat, they're throwing the rest of their food over and they're trusting. By the way, I did make it back. So, and then they're believing that they're going to be delivered and they had to throw it overboard and they did it all together. So what I saw in this is this, this unity, you know, we've been hearing the word unity lately in the news. This is true unity. When they all agree together to throw the rest of the food overboard, and we're all in to the process. We're all in. And that's what we have to do with Jesus in our own personal lives and as a church. Be unified in our goals. We can have different opinions about different parts of Scripture, but we can all agree on the essentials and move forward to win a lost world. And then verse 39, when day came, now they had to lighten the ship, by the way, because they were going to go across a shallow area, right? When the day came, verse 39, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. Now, this island they couldn't recognize was Malta, if you see in your, in your map there, is Malta. And... They decided to make it to the beach across the bay. So if you can picture a big open bay here, like if you came to, I don't know, a big bay, like Lanata Bay is a big bay, right? If you came to the mouth of Lanata Bay, who knows where that is out in Palos Verdes? You have is that avalanche over here and the point over here, and you want to go through the middle and try to get to the beach. They thought, well, that's a good idea. So let's see what happens. Verse 40. Casting off the anchors, they threw them off. They left them in the sea while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind and heading for the beach. So they took off the four anchors. They loosened the rudders so they could use them to steer, raised up the foresail to catch the wind and move straight ahead. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. So they ran aground, of some versions it said sandbar, but they ran aground on this reef, and it stuck, and so they didn't make it into the bay. They're out there at the edge of the bay, and the the stern of this boat is being broken up. So that means these waves are pretty big because remember there's 276 people on this boat. And I read, Josephus said that up to 600 people could be on these boats. So it's a big ship and not like the SS Minnow, a big ship 
and the back is being broken up by these waves, right? And so it's a pretty hectic situation. Think about this, you know, like the movies, Swiss Family Robinson, right? It's all being broken up. And, uh, and then it says here that um, in verse 42, the soldier's plan was to kill these prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. So they saw these guys, the ships being broken up, and they're afraid that they're going to all get away. And now remember, with the, with the Romans, if you lost the, the, your prisoner in your ca captivity, then you died. So it's like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 come back. <laughs> no, 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 don't you go. You're going to keep a, your guy because you die if you lose him, right? So at one point, they decide, well, let's just kill him all, you know? And, uh, but we know, okay, verse 43, but the centurion wanting to bring Paul safely through kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. So he's like, he's at this point, God knows he's going to get Paul to Rome. No, 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 we're not going to kill everybody. So God says in Philippians 2.13, he works in us and through us to bring about his good and pleasing will. So he moved the centurion to say, no, 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 don't kill him because I want Paul to get there safely. Not knowing, right, that Jesus had spoken to Paul. This is something God did through Julius, which is pretty cool. See how God works? We act, he responds. They made this action on the boat. He responded by protecting Paul. So he said, okay, everybody that can swim, who can swim? Oh, I was on the swim team in, you know, in Tel Aviv or, <laughs> you know, some guy. I could swim. So they all dove off the guys that could swim and started swimming to the beach. In this way, no lives would be lost. And it would confirm that what the angel said to Paul, remember, that no lives would be lost. So... Now comes the first time I've ever seen an official surfing event written in history. If you read verse 44. The rest should follow. If you can't swim, the rest should follow. Some on planks, some versions say boards, and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they were all brought safely to land. So here they are, big waves on a reef surf, right? They've got these big planks from the ship. They're being broken up. I figure they're about this wide, right? Wide enough. Probably pretty long, like from here to the that table. There's some long boards. So they're laying on these long boards and they're paddling across this bay to get to the beach. It's like the first massive bodyboarding session for sure. At least it's been documented in, in historical journals here. And then who knows, one of them stood up and went, hey, Paul, look, no hands. There's got to be one out of 276 people. Seriously. So I really do believe this is the first time surfing's ever been mentioned in ancient history. And uh, even though it goes back to Polynesia and even Peru, you know, but this is way before all that. I'm sorry. And I, I talked to... Um, I talked to Sean Thompson years ago when I was studying this in the 80s, and he called me and talked to me and said, yeah, I, I could see that happening because he surfed around the Mediterranean and the, and the waves get big in Malta. And then I talked to Sam George about it years ago when he was at Surfer Magazine. I said, I'm going to write an article because I think I found surfing in the Bible. He said, oh, really? Yeah. I said, well, don't tell anybody because I want to write the article. Well, the next issue, Surfer Magazine showed this guy standing in the shore break with a, with a log, like a piece of driftwood. And Sam wrote this article about the origins of surfing and said some people would point to an antediluvial origin of surfing. That was my, he put me in his article. And um, so that's kind of funny. But anyway, so there you have it. Surfing is in the Bible. So if you know any surfers that don't know the Lord, there, there's your little hook. Um, so... I invited a bunch of people all week surfing the Star Bar. Right now, there's a Star Bar at, by Rosecrans. It's like this perfect trestles peak. Shh, don't tell anybody. The really bowly left and a long right. And I've been inviting people all week just to come and see surfing in the Bible. A few people came. But we had a big group nonetheless. There was like over 70 people on the beach today, so it was a nice big group. But it's growing every week It's because it's outdoors, you know. So that's helpful. But anyway, praise the Lord. So next week, if you, 
We're going to be talking more about that down at the beach and find out what happens when they get on the island. And there's some really fun stuff. If you've not read Acts 27, there's some more fun stuff. I like adventurous reading anyway. So when I have that mixed in with the Bible, that's a win-win. And uh, so here we have a great example of how God has fulfilled his promise, right? He's going to get Paul to Rome. Short of that, he was going to save him on the ship, even though the ship was going to be lost. We don't know what's going to happen next, but he knows he's going to get to Rome. We know we're going to go to heaven. We don't know exactly how our life is going to end up, but he's going to preserve us as long as we need to preserve, as long as we continue to abide in him to get us to that point where our job is done. Our mission is complete. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship, created to do good works. He prepared in advance for us to do. So let's get after it and have fun. Serve the Lord, bear fruit, abide in Christ, and endure, right, on your enduro with the power of the Holy Spirit. So he wants us to reach the world, and he wants people to be saved. So are you assured of your salvation? Even in a small group like this, I don't know everybody here. Are you assured of your salvation? Do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven just like Paul knew he was going to go to heaven and short of that, he knew he was going to go to Rome? Are you assured? You know, we need to judge ourselves soberly. Not If you're worried about losing your salvation, you're probably saved. <laughs> you understand? I don't see people losing their salvation, but either you're in Christ or you're not. And at one point, I was not, and then I was. So you have, that starts by repenting, changing your mind, and believing, John 1, 12, receiving and abiding and following in Christ. And that's how we know we're in Christ. And our spirit, His Spirit will testify to our spirit, and we can say, Abba, Father, because we are His. Amen? Are you all tracking with me on this? This is good stuff. It'll make you want to serve the Lord, not because you have to, but because you get to. And it's a blessing. You should want to as a response to His love. So if you have not today repented and believed and are following and trusting the process in your life, I want to encourage you to do that today. Is there somebody in here that feels like, you know what, I need to be all in? I need to be all in. I'm, I'm making decisions right now for myself instead of letting God lead me. Raise your hand. I'd like to pray with you that you just want to be all in. That'd be a pretty bold hand to raise up. Who's doing that? Okay, good. Good. Because that's the best place to be, surrender to Jesus. That's where it all starts. When you say, your way, Yahweh, or his Kurt has said on his Africa trips, whatever, whenever, wherever, with whoever. I added the whoever. Because whosoever believes in him will have eternal life, not perish. So let me pray for you guys that feel like you want to be all in. Just repeat with me. Lord, I give you my life. Say that out loud if this is you. You want to pray. Lord, I give you my life. I abide in you. I follow you. I want to trust you. Bear fruit through me. Help me endure to the end by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys. We'll um, have the worship team come up. And uh, let's keep, keep on keeping on with Jesus. Amen. Did I leave anything out? I forgot to go back over there. I get so caught up in my Bible. Thank you, Ross. What a blessing you are. Hallelujah. Surfing in the Bible. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, everybody stand if you can. We're going to praise the Lord.
Are you ready, praise and worship team? Healed, your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay. Myself, I belong to you. Lead me, lead me to the cross. You were as I tempted and tried. sin and death now you're risen everything I once held dear I count it all as lost lead me to the cross where your love poured out bring me to my knees Lord I lay me down rid me of myself I belong Left my fear by the side of the road Hear you speak, won't let go Fall to my knees as I lift my hands to pray Got every reason to be here again Father's love draws me in All my eyes want to see is a glimpse of you All I need is you All I need is you, Lord the same spirit calls my heart to sing drawn to the voice of my savior once again 
Where would my soul be without your son? He gave his life to save the earth. Rest in the thought that you're watching over me. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. It's you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. Is you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. is all we need. Lord, thank you so much for the sermon today, Lord. Thank you for the encouragement to hold strong in the faith, stay on the ship, and not slip off into the world, but be steadfast and just be f full of joy serving the Lord and keeping on with uh, telling people around us that don't know him about you, Lord. Thank you so much that somebody told us, Lord. Thank you for Ross Russell and his message today, Lord. Lots of encouragement. Keep us strong, Father God, through your Holy Spirit. We love you and we pray this in your precious son Jesus' name. Amen.